Welcome, everybody. It's Thursday, October 23rd, 2014. And we're talking today about Ebola, but it doesn't have to be Ebola. The point is, there have been some questions about what would libertarians do when faced with the outbreak of a disease like Ebola? What, if anything, could libertarians do? Would they just be sitting around so darn principled that they'd rather see the whole world drop dead than do anything about it? Is that really true? Well, joining us to talk about this today, of course, is Robert P. Murphy, economist Bob Murphy, who is also an outstanding libertarian theorist, as you can see in his short book, Chaos Theory. You all know Bob. He is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal, as well as The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. You can find his textbook, sort of like an early high school, late junior high textbook, for free online called Lessons for the Young Economist. Bob blogs at consultingbyrpm.com. Bob Murphy, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. I've had a lot of requests to get somebody on to talk about Ebola and what would libertarians do, what would you do in a stateless society, how would this be handled. And, of course, I didn't get requests for just anyone to come on and talk about this. I was specifically asked, get Murphy on here and have him tell us what we're supposed to do about Ebola or what we would do in the absence of the CDC and the governmental apparatus and all that. So... I want to dive right into that. We'll talk about your plan or what, how you envision this. We'll contrast it with proposals that other libertarians have had, and then, of course, contrast it with the government's response. Because, of course, somebody might say, the government's response is at least adequate, so why would you engage in these utopian fantasies about stateless societies? That's, those are not my words. Those are the critics' words. All right, what is the Murphy framework for understanding how to deal with something like Ebola and quarantines? Well, I'm glad that your listeners automatically think of me whenever they picture diseases. That's reassuring <laughs> to know. Uh, so here's my, my framework, and here I'm relying on the framework that I developed in my essay, Private Law, that's in the pamphlet Chaos Theory. So if people want to learn more about this general framework I'm describing, I would refer them to that. Uh, so th the idea is... I picture in a free society, I mean, what do we mean by that? We mean that people have well-defined property rights that are generally respected. All right, so right off the bat, you can't have a, the notion of a modern state because that systematically violates people's property rights. But in a society where the general rule is people, certainly all the institutions, respect property rights as they're defined, how do you deal with situations like this? And what I, the way I think it would, the, the starting point would be is that in order to have... Uh, an institution like a like a big airport, how would you even be, get the permission to build that? Because that's kind of risky, right? All the, the local land uh, owners having these huge metal objects flying overhead back and forth filled with all sorts of flammable material, namely jet fuel. You know, that's sort of risky. So how would that happen? So I think even to build an airport, you would have to have contractual arrangements with people around you to have the permission to do that. And... Uh, in particular, I think insurance companies would play a large role in all these negotiations. And if, for example, the, the local landowners, they might receive a pledge from the people wanting to build an airport that says, if a plane should come down and, or a piece flies off of it and smacks into my house and kills me or blows up my house or whatever, you, the people running the airport, pledge to indemnify me, and they would need to have reputable insurance companies backing that up. All right, and so there would be risk analysis and, and that sort of thing involved because the insurance companies would have actuaries to price these risks and know what premiums to charge and so on. And that's why, you know, that's how I think air travel would be, quote, regulated without having the FAA, things like that, that insurance companies would be there to say the premiums we're going to charge you, the airlines, to back up your, your flight in case you, the plane crashes and all the people die. The customers flying would also probably want clauses in the contract saying, if the plane crashes, we get a million dollars from the airline or whatever the number is. And so the, the insurance companies would do a lot of the regulatory spot checking, make sure the pilots aren't drunk and stuff like that. So that's the, the general framework of how I'm picturing, quote, regulation 
occurs in a genuinely free society because everybody agrees to this stuff on the front end. Nobody's being forced at gunpoint into this. It's just saying if you want to buy this land and develop it and so forth, the original owners have the right to demand certain concessions. So in that context, and that's the, the way that I think you would see what we nowadays, you know, the, the public right now, everyone kind of has this intuitive feel that surely it's not unreasonable that people flying from Liberia into JFK should receive more scrutiny than people coming over from Canada. You know, people kind of know that maybe that wouldn't be such a bad policy. Maybe that wouldn't be outrageous discrimination in a situation like this. And yet they also know, I don't trust the government to just say, oh, there's a danger of contamination, and so therefore we can just lock people up until we say they're safe. And we can just keep people under house arrest. People also recoil at that. And, and that's correct, and that just shows why you cannot trust the state to perform needed social functions. Just like education is important, roads are important, having the ability to defend yourself from foreign military attack, that's important. Those are all important things, but anarcho-capitalists are against the federal government doing those things because it does them poorly and because then it will use that power against its own people. It doesn't mean we're against education or transportation or the military defense. It just means giving the government that power, A, won't achieve the stated goal, and B, will be used against you to hurt you. So it's the same thing, you know, that's, that's the general framework, and I'll stop and, and let you, you know, take the conversation and further, but I just want to remind people that the state cannot be trusted to protect Americans or whatever country we're talking about from a contagious disease, just like the state botches everything else, and then if you did give it the power to do that, it would use those powers not to protect you from disease, but to take away your liberty. Bob, have you heard anything about the Ebola killing robot? Because apparently it, it uses ultraviolet. Uh, it it uh, it basically kills everything in a room so that you don't have to worry about uh, contamination. You can presumably use it on some of the hazmat suits. You can, in, in other words, you can decontaminate rooms very easily with this thing. And yet, it looks like the CDC was either completely unaware of this technology or was aware of it and inexplicably hadn't acquired any, and yet this is going to solve, this is the thing that will get people to go back to the hospitals. That, that hospital in Dallas is absolutely hemorrhaging money because no one's coming through the door because they're afraid of Ebola. But they would be reassured by this type of technological innovation. They don't trust the government's word, but they would trust the private sector coming up with a gadget like this and saying, look, this thing will allay your fears? Uh, I, I do not know the specifics of that particular device, and, and probably we should give the disclaimer that neither Tom nor I are medical doctors. Yeah, you know? but, and I, <laughs> we don't play them in any conceivable role. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, I, I think your general point is right. And, again, just to, you know, it, we can move it away from the issue of uh, the, the terrifying issue of a, of a highly contagious or what could be a highly contagious disease. And just in general, government agencies are inefficient They do in terms of achieving their stated goal. And so why would you expect If there really were a very cheap solution to this, not you wouldn't expect the government agency to go for it because it's in their interest to have this huge public outcry and then say, oh, well, we're underfunded, we need more money. And whether you want to be really cynical and say they're doing it on purpose in order to get money or just to say it's in the institutional structure and the bureaucrats are promoted and rewarded who have that mentality and they genuinely are incompetent and don't see the simple solution staring them in the face either way the result is the same that you should not be surprised that government agencies overlook obvious things i mean it's even just people who aren't ideological and who weren't predisposed to distrust the government they can all see that how the u.s government has responded to this crisis makes no sense at all I mean, I, I tweeted out the other day, I was just being a wise guy about it, saying the federal government to foreigners, sure, you can come here and spread Ebola, just don't try to get a job, right? And so that, that's what I'm trying to say in terms of how the government and the Obama administration deals with border control is, you know, they're saying, oh, you can't come in here and, and steal our jobs, but hey, it would be completely unfair discrimination to, you know, hold up people coming from Liberia because they might have Ebola, you know, that that would be crazy. We, the federal government, have no business interfering with the freedom of travel, and yet they do that all the time. So it's not what they actually care about. 
not interfering with people's ability to go where they want geographically. They just are selectively applying those principles in a way that makes no sense whatsoever as far as the normal person is concerned. It makes total sense if you think that what the government is trying to do is come up with ways to scare people and have pretexts to expand its power. Bob, of course there's been a lot of commentary on this by libertarians precisely because critics of libertarianism have been saying things like, there is no libertarian response to something like Ebola, you know, other than sitting around and watching everyone die because you're so wedded to your so-called liberties. I mean, that's the kind of response yeah. that we've seen. Should, so, should, been, should we? Yeah, should we maybe talk a little bit about just more give more specificity to what we could do, like practical stuff? Yeah, well, that's what I want to do. So, I want to say, okay. I, I want to ask first of all if you've read what other libertarians have been saying to try to parry that criticism and then contrast it maybe with your own approach. And this is this would be your chance to flesh it out more. Okay, sure. So um, I, uh, without naming too many names, I, I think there is a uh, a danger of some, I've seen some libertarians who are, they're only focusing on the fact that the way the government is doing it is, is bad or inefficient or dangerous and that, hey, wait a minute, I don't trust these guys. So in other words, I've seen two different types of, let's just call them conspiracy theorists, not, not that that's a derogatory term, but I'm just trying to get people to understand the sort of critique I'm talking about. And some people will go the full route and say, yeah, the U.S. government invented this. It's a weaponized version. That's why it's, you know, catching health care workers because they were just doing things they weren't prepared for. Da, 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 da. And so clearly in that case, if you think the U.S. government originated it, then obviously the the correct response is not to say, let's give the people in D.C. more power to deal with this if you think they created it. But then on the other hand, I've seen people say, oh, no, this isn't a threat at all. Don't worry. This is crazy. This is completely manufactured by the mainstream media. They're just trying to scare us, and that's why the government doesn't need power. So in those two extremes, I think the danger is it almost concedes that if there really were a, a naturally occurring, uh, highly contagious disease, then yes, in a free society, we'd be sitting ducks. Exactly, which is, which is why I think those writers are obligated in those articles to say, for the sake of argument, let's just imagine that Ebola really is as bad as they're saying it is. Here's how it would be handled, instead of just leaving that floating there. Right. So, uh, so the, the general approach I've done, again, piggybacking on that, that framework of, remember, every parcel of real estate is owned by somebody, and that I think in order to develop a shopping mall or a hospital, for sure. You know, if you're going to build a, a building where lots of sick people are going to be coming and going, in order, you know, it's not like everybody in a, in a John Locke fashion homesteaded all their property on day one of the free society. I think there would be plenty of plots of land that would have been owned by one person or institution, and then developers would come in and have to buy the rights to that and then put the hospital on it. So I'm saying there, there would be a framework where they would have to get permission from various people in the region before going ahead with their plan. And so I think there would be all sorts of contractual arrangements such that if somebody comes into the hospital and with the, with the threat of having a contagious disease, then the hospital would have procedures saying, yeah, you can come in here and we'll treat you, but you're agreeing one, you know, once you check in, if we think you have a contagious disease, then we get to hold you until our experts sign off and say that you're uh, not contagious anymore, you know, or they can, they could have backup things like if you highly disagree, you could have outside people come in and then you can get transferred to a different hospital under, you know, using an ambulance that we, our experts tell us is safe and won't leak into the outside community. Da, da, da. And insurance companies would be backing all that up saying, Hey, if you live down the street from the hospital, that's treating these really contagious people, then there's contractual arrangements that if somehow there's a mistake and your family gets the thing, and the hospital owes you a million dollars per case. Or Again, I'm just making these numbers up. I just want to show you can imagine a contractual web dealing with these sorts of things because it's, it's not like only government bureaucrats have the imagination to realize there's such thing as contagious diseases. In a free society, people would have all that information, but there would be competition, and so if one city somewhere came up with a really clever solution, everybody else could copy it. Whereas right now, it's all our eggs are in one basket. We're hoping the federal government does it right, and if they get it wrong, well, tough luck for us. Well, let's imagine it's we're living in Murphyville, 
and <laughs> Ebola breaks out. And let's say that somehow you can detect Ebola without being diagnosed in a hospital. Let's say that that somehow by looking at the person, you know that person has Ebola. So that you, you can see two people on your street in two different houses. They both have it. What now takes place in Murphyville? What's the next step? Well, I think, I mean, clearly people who own shopping centers and apartment buildings and things like that can have the right to say you're not allowed onto our premises if you're testing positive for this contagious disease. Okay, so I guess what I'm saying is rather than viewing it as we need to have the ability for an armed group of people to go grab somebody and kidnap them and put them in somewhere else under lockdown, it would rather be the community. So there could be a company that springs forth and says, we uh, track such people, and we give a heads up to everybody. So they're getting funded by the general community, and their their mission is, their, their function is to warn people of, yeah, there's a guy who's tested positive for this thing, and right now he's he's here. And right now he's here, and you know, you're, you're allowed to give information to people. That, that's not breaking anybody's privacy or anything. And so that would give a heads up. And so the people who own those roads could say, no, no you're not allowed on here. Get off my land. And if you, if you refuse to listen to me, well, then you're, I'm allowed to have people come and forcibly remove you from my property. So I'm saying it's a lot of what people are intuitively realizing has to be possible. Like if there really is somebody who's got this, let's not even say it's a bull, let's say something much worse that if you get anywhere near that person, you get sick and then you end up dying two days later also. And, and those people are just, let's just say there's some guy walking around trying to infect as many people as possible. We kind of have this idea that you know, I don't know whether we call it a crime or what, but surely we can't. We don't have to just sit back there and let that happen. Surely there's got to be some way we can stop that guy. And I'm saying, yeah, if all the land is privately owned, then you have the right to tell such a person, get off my land, don't come on my land, and if you do, we'll take whatever steps needed. And the police or whatever you want to be, the security agencies responding to that specific threat, they would, of course, have done the research and, and their personnel will be properly you know, have the, the suits on or whatever to make sure that they don't get sick. And not, yeah, this stuff isn't perfect that I'm saying, but nothing in human society is. But the point is the incentives are going to be there, and there's going to be competition so that if one group does it wrong and they send their security team and they end up getting sick, well, then they're going to quickly re react to that, and all the other competing security firms are going to say, whoa, what did they do wrong? Let's make sure that our people don't get sick and they have, you know, have better equipment. So people can extrapolate from what you've just said to seeing how the idea of a travel ban would be dealt with in this sort of situation. You wouldn't strictly need a travel ban. It would be a matter of private property owners saying, well, you know, you can travel to any place that will have you, but I personally will not have you. And that that's that, right? Exactly. And so, uh, and, and, I, and I think that balances, you know, in other words, you don't have in a free society, there's no such thing as this abstract right to go wherever you want. No, it's the, the what the right is is that you have your property and you can use it as you see fit, and other people can't use the threat or application of force against you to stop you from using your just property. So in a free society, if you don't own the road, you don't have the right to walk onto it against the wishes of the owner. And and but other people say they worry and they say, wow, it sounds like your world could be a totalitarian nightmare. Well, there's there's always competition, and so if if you if somebody just over you know if some road owner is really paranoid and is listening to medical uh, experts who really don't know what they're talking about, and he thinks that this guy over here, Jim Smith, is a walking time bomb in terms of contagion, and he says, Jim, you can't come on my own property, but really, Jim is fine. You know, Jim just has the flu. Well, there's going to be plenty of other road owners with better advisors, medical advisors, who are going to say, no, that guy's fine, and they're going to capture his business, just like. If there's one employer who really is a racist or something, that's not going to cripple the free society. It's just he'll miss out on potentially good employees that will get snatched up by other employers who have more correct views. So it's the same thing here that th there is this tension between you know, it, the situation of a highly contagious disease. There's no getting around the fact that you, society, you know, people in general have this desire to contain the spread of it, and yet you don't want to be unfair and, and lock somebody up in quarantine who really isn't contagious, right? And you want to be, of course, compassionate to the people who are sick and try to get them care and whatever. And so I'm saying in a free society, those various 
desires are going to be balanced as, as humanely and as efficiently as possible. All right, let me ask you the million-dollar question. I think in this brief discussion, you've laid out a plausible scenario for how people would handle situations like this in the absence of official coercion. But you're going to get this objection, and it's not a stupid objection by any means. We don't live in Murphyville yet. Maybe Murphyville is a desirable place, and maybe someday we'll get there, but we don't live there now. And right now, we have on our hands what could be a major health issue. Now, maybe it won't, but it doesn't matter. In theory, we could potentially someday be faced with a really serious health issue, and we don't have all the property in the world privately owned, and we are contemplating travel bans as the lesser evil, because the greater evil would be a pandemic that wipes out half the world's population. Surely a travel ban has to be the lesser evil. How does a libertarian sort that out? Well, my sort of (laughs) <laughs> dodging the question responses to say, on these types of issues, I don't think there is a clean, purist response. Exactly. I don't right? either, but I, I'm yeah. just curious to know what your right. own personal... And, and I also, I think I want to even put a, a, a caveat here and, and make sure people understand that whatever Bob's answer is going to be, you cannot write him out of the libertarian movement for it, because <laughs> because when you're dealing with this situation... Of the state exists now. How do we cope with it? There are all kinds of different possible responses. Walter Block has one. Bob has one. Because it isn't the world that we want, and it doesn't obey the rules of libertarianism. So, in a way, you have to deal with it pragmatically. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of like you know, the soldier saying, "I'm going to either shoot that you know uh, adult over there who's 35, or I'm going to shoot these 10 kids." who are one-year-old and we don't know who's got the potential, which one should I do, what's your input, you know, and you, go, and you want to say, do neither. But you say, no, no, that's not an acceptable answer. Go ahead, tell me. Exactly, so. and so either answer you give, people say, oh my gosh, he's a murderer. Yeah, no, right. Oh yeah, so right. Murphy's not a murderer, and he doesn't want to spread disease, and he doesn't want to stop people from traveling. We're just working this out just to, as an intellectual exercise. Yes. Okay, so my personal gut reaction to what's going on is um, I am concerned that the the government will, the U.S. government is going to try to use this to expand what the public thinks is an acceptable uh, use of its powers. Like it, it will want, to, just like with the, the Boston bombing and how it locked down that whole area and just had police going literally door to door searching for those people. Just, I, I think Part of that was they want to get the American people used to seeing armed men just roaming the streets, searching house to house, and for people to think, oh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that does happen in America now. And so, to me, I am not as concerned about this turning into a pandemic as that this is going to, this is being exaggerated and is going to be used as a pretext to expand the police state and to make it normal that, well, yeah, if there's an emergency, of course the government can just grab somebody and say he's got to stay under house arrest until they deem him safe. Because that that principle, of course, could be very convenient to the people in power. Um, so, w- as far as the air, I mean, I, I suppose it's. I, I'm not going to go crazy though. Having said that, you know, that's my general reaction. But having said that, I'm not going to flip out. I suppose if if the the airline. I mean, what I would prefer is that the airlines themselves voluntarily said. Either we're we're not for the foreseeable future accepting inbound flights from Liberia or the you know affected regions, or they said we're going to have a special extra screening thing as a courtesy to our other customers because we realize you might not want to fly this air you know such and such if you think you're going to be sit- sitting in the waiting lounge with somebody who just came from Sierra Leone. So as a courtesy to you, we're going to have these extra procedures. So now feel safe. So I, I would for much prefer that these common sense precautions were voluntary and i don't know the law enough i mean for all i know it would be illegal for the airlines to do that they might get hit with an anti-discrimination lawsuit so it's a really unfortunate situation where the u.s government has so many regulations it's almost like they make it impossible for private firms to do sensible things in a case like this Uh, bob i don't usually finish our discussions this way but on an topic like this, I want to make sure you've said everything you want to say. Is there anything I didn't hit on that you want to cover? 
Well, I just would want to reiterate the, the fact that we can't fall into the trap of thinking just because there's some issue that would require a lot of coordination among different people, therefore coercion is the only way to achieve that. That in, just as a general rule, giving one group the, the power with guns to just impose their will on everybody else, history and theory show that that's not the way to achieve uh, solutions to admittedly thorny problems where there's various competing desires and it's not obvious what the trade-off should be in a certain situation. Just as in general, having the government spy on people in order to protect us from terrorists, that doesn't mean terrorists don't exist. There really are terrorists and we want to be protected from them, but giving the federal government the power to spy on people to protect us, that is obviously going to give us neither safety nor freedom. By the same token, there are such things as contagious diseases, and humans should be able to adapt to them, but giving the federal government power to achieve that outcome is a foolish idea, as I think the government's actual real-world response, and I guess that would be my last statement, is to say don't look at all the conceivable problems you could imagine with a free market response and compare that to a super-perfect government response. Look at what the government in the real world is doing. Look at how ridiculous it is that... The nurses got, you know, we're getting sick under the current system. And you can't just say, oh, well, that was the hospital's fault. That was, no, right now the CDC exists. The government has a monopoly on certain things telling us we need to have this system in place because freedom would be horrible. So all the results that are occurring right now have to be laid at the feet of the government's door. All right, we'll leave it right there. Bob Murphy, thanks so much. I've got economic questions for you. We'll get you back uh, sometime in the future to try and answer those, but this was a great and interesting conversation today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tom. Always a pleasure. All right, everybody. I am still working, of course, on those courses that I'm creating for the Ron Paul Homeschool Program, which you can visit at ronpaulhomeschool.com. Right now I'm doing Western Civilization from 1493. So this week I'm talking a little bit about France before Louis XIV. I'm talking about the decline of Spain, which had once been a very, very significant European power. And, of course, one of the things that contributes to its decline, one of several important factors, is that it overextends itself in foreign policy and finally simply has to withdraw from its oversized role in European affairs because it just doesn't have the money. Well, how about that? Then I'm talking this week about constitutionalism, and I'm talking about absolutism. One lesson on one, one lesson on the other. These are important European themes. Of course, in constitutionalism, I'm contrasting the English and the Dutch with some of the other peoples in Western Europe at that time. So that's what I'm working on right now. That course is available at ronpaulhomeschool.com, and I stay a little bit ahead of the students this first time through, and then... It'll be fully recorded, and people can access it whenever. But people who are dying to get access to it can access it as I'm creating it. And I'm, as I say, I'm just staying ahead of the students. But in terms of the courses that I've completely finished that will be available from now until the end of the world, you can get those both at ronpaulhomeschool.com. And if you don't want to join the Ron Paul program, you just want the courses that I've created because you're just not getting enough Woods content on the Tom Woods show, then head over to tomwoodshomeschool.com. And don't feel like, well, I'm an adult. Why would I need to look at these courses? This is material that I guarantee you we could all stand to learn a little bit better. Western Civilization from the Ancient World to 1492 and my government course, which is more or less an anti-government course, but it covers a, a wide array of topics. Check those out at TomWoodsHomeschool.com. Remember, too, that my new book is out, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. Get details on it at RealDescent.com. Those of you who support the show as supporting listeners already have the Kindle edition of the book. SupportingListeners.com is how you can do that. But you can also get the audiobook for free. If you haven't done so already, you can get a free audiobook through TomWoodsAudio.com. And yes, I'm the one narrating the book. How about that? Tomorrow, I will be heading out the door to hop on a plane to head to Idaho for the Idaho Liberty Expo. I'm keynoting that Saturday night. 
But before I leave, I'm going to do probably a Q&A episode with some of the questions I've gotten emailed to me. Those of you who get the Tom Woods letter, which of course you can sign up for at TomWoods.com, know that I put out a general request for questions, and I've gotten some. So I think I'm going to do a quick Q&A episode before I hop on that plane. So thanks so much for listening, everybody. Tune in for that tomorrow, and thanks so much for listening. The Tom Woods Show. 